You know, I want to talk a little bit about fear today because I've, I've seen fear, I felt fear. You know, you, you see all these things, fear in other people, fear in yourself. You know, I want to talk a little bit about fear of coping with fear and using it to your benefit. Can you know that you can actually use fear to your benefit? Well, let's go. Let's, uh, open your Bibles. Turn with me to Psalm 56. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. This, turn with me to Psalm 56. Now, this is the Psalm of David. Not all the Psalms, of course, are of David, but this one is. Psalm 56 and verse 3. David said this, when I am afraid, Hebrew word here is yare, when I am afraid, David said, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? You know, this is a good question David uh, was writing. He wrote this particular psalm, you know, when he, he at the, it was a time when the Philistines and Gath had seized them and they were thinking about putting them to death because they felt, and rightly so, that he was an enemy of the Philistines. And, you know, and in here, you know, David write this, but when I am afraid, what is my response? When I'm afraid... I put my trust in you. You know, yeah, I praise God for what he has promised, and he has promised us incredible things. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? David is writing. Why should I be afraid? Well, why should we be afraid? You know, when we think about these things as Christians, why should we be afraid? The Hebrew word, as I said, what David originally penned is Yahweh, Yare. It's become afraid, frightened, fear, fearful, dismayed. But it has, a norm, it has another meaning, too, because fear can be, has these two aspects. It has a negative aspect, and it has a positive aspect. Now, let's go to Psalm 111. Psalm 111. I'm going to read this one in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. That's Psalm 111. This psalm, it opens up in verse 1. It says, Hallelujah, which is praise to, to Yahweh. Hallelujah, I will praise the Lord with my heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The Lord's works are great, studied by all who delight in them. That's why we read the Bible. The Lord's works are great. And, you know, because we delight in God, we do study them, that we might be instructed by them. Verse 2, verse 3, And all that he does is splendid and majestic. His righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonderful works to be remembered, and he has. This is why we have these things. God has made sure that these things have not been forgotten. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. God's good. This is one of the reasons why we worship him. This is, one of the, this is why we trust him. He keeps his word. In verse 5, he has provided food for those who fear him. Again, here's that word, yare. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the inheritance of the nations. You know, as Christians, aren't we going to have an inheritance of the nations? And God is going to remember his covenant and provide us these things that this is so long, this is what's going to come to us. When you think of Matthew 5.5, 5, the Beatitudes, it's blessed are the meek for they shall what? They will inherit the earth. You know, God's just not speaking metaphorically. He's speaking about, you know, what's coming for us. This is our inheritance of what we have. So we're going back to Psalm 111, verse 6. He has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the inheritance of the nations. It's happened before, okay, when he gave the children of Israel the promised land. And it is going to happen yet again. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. Verse 7, the works of his hands are truth and justice. All his instructions are trustworthy. 
They are established forever and ever, enacted in truth and in what is right. He has sent his redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. His name is holy and awe-inspiring. And then here's the verse here, verse 10. The fear, the fear of the Lord. Here it's, it's yare, it's a cognate of yare. Well, the, it is the same word, essentially. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his instructions have good insight. His praise endures forever. The fear of the Lord. So there is a positive aspect to fear. It's just not, you know, why should I be afraid, you know, when bad things happen to me? You know, that's, that we all know about that fear because we live in this world. We all have bad things that can happen to us. In a blink of an eye, a car can cross going the other way, can cross the, the center line and crash into you or, or, you know, make the effort to do so. These things happen. We know that. We know that all of a sudden we could have a health crisis or something, you know, all these things. This is the kind of world we live in. Fear is something we've all experienced to one degree or another, but God is saying that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his instructions have good insight. His praise endures forever. The Amplified says in this verse, Psalm 111, verse 10, the reverent fear and worship of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and skill. This reverent fear and worship of God, it's, it's the beginning of everything that, you know, when he's talking of wisdom and skill, it says the preceding and the first, you know, essential. It is the prerequisite. A good understanding, wisdom, and meaning have all those who do. Who do with this wisdom that God reveals instructs them to do. A good understanding, wisdom, and meaning have all those who do and it's understood the will of the Lord. See, what we learn from God is we must do. I, this is one of the fundamental keys of learning to understand the Bible. Many people, you know, will study the Bible for a long time, but they still will not fully under, really get its message or what it has to say because it's written to the people of God, not to outsiders. And the people of God are people who do. What God tells us to do, you know, it instructs us and teaches us, we do. And as we do, we learn and we gain more and more understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. It's the prerequisite to be able to understand what he's telling us, to understand, you know, what life is all about and how to deal with life, how to deal with fear. Psalm 111 is talking about the godly fear of the finite in the presence of the infinite. We are the finite, okay? We're, we are definitely finite. We are, you know, we have beginning points and ending points. We have limited this, that, and the other, all these things. We're very finite in our existence. But God is infinite. He's eternal. He lasts forever. It is a wholesome and a spiritually profitable fear that a sin-prone mortal can have, or should have anyways, in the presence of a being who is eternal, who is good, who is an incredible being, who loves us, who loves his creation, but also who is holy. According to the scriptures, you know, what it talks about, the fear of the Lord here is, again, is this, this uh, Hebrew word yare. It's used in regards to fearing the, in the when, it's, when, when it's translated in your Bible, fearing the Lord. It's, it's, what it's talking about is having a reverential affection for God. This is what it's talking about. It's not being, you know, I'm, I'm scared of him, okay, and I want to run away. That's not what it's talking about. It's having this reverential affection, this, you know, this, this honor that we have towards God. This is something that we, you know, this is the positive aspect of fear. And you see in, in the Hebrew, they can be used, and we'll see this in the, in the Greek Bible as well, 
Fear can be oftentimes some of the words that can be used uh, ha can have a positive connotation or a negative connotation, okay, as far as how, how it should be fear. But we should fear, we really should to fear to offend such a, such a powerful being, a good being, a transcendent being. You know, we should, you know, this sort of reverential, uh, uh, affectionate fear that we have for him should inform everything we do in our life and what we think. And that's what we need to consider because we are emotional beings and we have things that happen to us. But if we consider what God has done in the past, if we study these things and think on these things, if we do what he says, then we should have confidence and not let our fears, our, our fears of this or that and the other, overwhelm us and surpass the fear that we have for him and for what he has to say. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. But the Bible is saying very clearly here in, in Psalms 111 that a person only begins to be wise in a scriptural sense, in a spiritual sense. He only begins to becomes to be wise when he begins to fear the Lord, have this reverential respect and affection for God. That's when. That's the only time when we, you know, that we really begin to gain wisdom. So there is very clearly the Bible, Psalm 111 being the point in making this, is that there is an appropriate godly fear. That is useful for a Christian. But of course there is another kind of human fear that's not so useful. It's something we, we can't let our lives be run by. Let's turn with me to Mark in the Gospels. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And we'll take a look at what Jesus had to say. Mark 4 and verse 35. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version. On the same day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. This is the, the, what we sometimes call the Sea of Galilee, which is just, it's a great big lake, Lake Kinneret. Verse 36, And leaving the throng, they took him with them, just as he was in the boat in which he was sitting. And the other boats were with him. Verse 37, And a furious storm of wind, of hurricane proportions, arose. And the waves kept beating into the boat, so that it was already becoming filled. But he himself was in the stern of the boat, asleep on a leather cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? So the disciples were there. They were you know, in this boat, and they were crossing the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is asleep. You know, is he asleep at the switch? You know, the disciples looked at him, they saw, and they saw their situation. Went, Don't you care that we're, you know, we're dying, we're going to drown? Fear was, uh, was, was rising in them because, you know, they, they had things. You know, they looked at all their circumstances. Fear was taking hold of them. Do you not care that we are perishing? Verse 37, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush now, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was immediately a great calm, a perfect peacefulness. And he said to them, Why are you so timid and fearful? so full of fear. Greek word here is delios. How is it that you have no faith, no firmly relying trust? And they were filled with great awe and feared, here the word is phobos, and feared exceedingly and said to one another, who is this that even wind and sea obey him? The Greek word in verse 40 here of, of Mark chapter 4 is the word delios. Delios in Greek, yes, we it can be translated fear, but it's a sort of a, a cowardly, timid fear. Delios, in delios, one is fearful of losses. It's easy to be fearful of losses. 
If it refers to an adelios, refers to an excessive fear or dread of losing. Losing what you have. Losing someone you love. Losing a place, a situation, a job, your, your health, whatever it might be. Your, your, your fearful delios of losses. It's causing someone, delios causes someone to be faint-hearted. And it, by in consequences of having what the Greek says is delios of being fearful is to be cowardly and to eventually... Spiritually speaking, it means falling short in certain situations of following Christ as the Lord of our life. So this is something that is not good. There is a sort of fear that is not good. And very clearly, Jesus, when he asked him, you know, why are you so fearful? You know, why are you so fearful? You know, I'm not going to just let you perish. You know, you're in the boat with me. Why are you so fearful, my disciples? There is, we have to be careful of fear. Fear is extremely powerful. And it can just take over and run people's lives. And we have to be aware of this. We can't take counsel of our fears. We have to take counsel of our faith, our faith in God and the promises of what he's doing for us. We have to have faith so that we continue to set and do, do those things that are going to be pleasing in the sight. It's ultimately, this word delios is, is, is not used a whole lot in scriptures, this, this, because it's, it's, it's never used in a positive way in the scriptures, of this, fearful, this fearfulness of losses, of you know, having this excessive dread of losing something one wants or desires or needs. Let's go to Revelation 21.7. I want to show you one of the other places it's used. That's Revelation 21.7. The one who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the delios, okay, the, 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 the fearful, and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and fornicators and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We must be here one who overcomes. Because the saying here very clearful. But the fearful, the delios, and then they list all these other aspects. All these other terrible things, these moral uh, defects, the people who have these things will not be in the kingdom of God. They will not be among the meek that will inherit the earth. We don't want to be fearful, delios. So fearful of losses of what we might lose in pursuing perhaps the Christian way of life that we don't take... You know, we don't do what we need to do. Again, Revelation 21.7 is a somber thing to think about. Delios, as I said, of this Greek word. But the cowardly, or that is the fearful, you know, they're going to go to the lake of fire. It's always used in a negative sense in the New Covenant's Greek scriptures. And it stands in contrast to the occasional positive use of fear of the Greek word phobos. Let's take another, because the, the, the New Testament or the, the New Covenant scriptures have these two uses, but they use two different words. Delios is always negative, but phobos, you know, it's, it's mostly negative, but it can also be used in a positive sense, just like the Hebrew. But in Philippians 2.12, it says this, Apostle Paul wrote this, so then, my beloved, even as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear, that's phobos, okay, the Greek word is phobos, and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear. See, this is a reverential fear of God that must be at the core of our being because we love God. And, you know, we're in awe of God. 
For it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So when we have, when we work out our own salvation with the fear of God, see, it doesn't prevent us from doing what we need to do because we're fearful of losses or fearful of the consequences of standing up, perhaps, and to be counted as a Christian, to stand up and, and so that, you know, where, where notice is taken of us. Phobos, as I said, is sometimes positively used in relationship to God, the fear of God, just as it is used typically in the Hebrew um, scriptures. But much more often, it is used negatively. When it's used in, you'll, you'll see it's more negatively used. And with people who are fearful, they are withdrawing from the Lord okay, and his will. They're withdrawing. They're, they're, they're fleeing, as it were, because they feel inadequate in the resources they have to confront or do whatever it is they need to do. We can't be that way. We can't be, you know, fearful in either in this phobo sense of feeling we're totally inadequate up to the task. And so we withdraw. We stop walking with Christ. Or delios, we're cowardly. We're too afraid of the losses. So we won't do anymore. We can't be. We can't be either in the negative sense of phobos or or in delios. We can't have that sort of fear. We must work out our salvation with the fear of God, having that as our priority first of all. This this the sense the disciples, you know, you would think, you know, like, and we shouldn't feel that. Just because we're human and we have to deal with our weaknesses and fear is, is it can be part is uh, can be a real major factor in a lot of people's lives that we're alone in this. Now, even the disciples, those who actually walked with Christ, who touched him, who spent three and a half years with him during his being taught by him, you know, getting to know him well, these the disciples still had the things that they had to overcome. They had their fears that they had to deal with. Let's turn with me to John, John chapter 20 and verse 19. Now you know, of course, when at the time when the Romans and the religious authorities, the Jewish religious authorities who were upset with Jesus, angry at Jesus, when they seized him and put him on trial for his life, you know, the, the, the other disciples, they, they put space between them and Jesus. They, you know, they, they fled. You know the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, and all that. And after, his, after Jesus was crucified, we see this in John 20, 19. I'm, I'll cite this here in the ESV. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear, phobos, of the Jews, that is, the religious leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees who had power and they had troops and guards, you know, and prisons and all these things at their command. You know, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear, for fear of these people who were persecuting them. And Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, this atmosphere of highly charged with fear, peace be with you. Peace be with you. See, Jesus, this was one of the first things that he was going to explain to the disciples. But it was something that people were fearful of other people, of what they thought and of the consequences of being connected with Jesus in some way. At that time, it was very dangerous. Let's go to John, staying here in the Gospel of John, John chapter 7 and verse 10. John chapter 7 and verse 10. But there was, you know, there, there, there was something, you know, there was significance. It wasn't that it was a false fear. I mean, there was you know, potential. There was potential of something that could happen that was bad if you were connected with Jesus. John chapter 7 and verse 10. But after his brothers, that's Jesus' brothers, had gone up to the feast... He, that is Jesus, also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast. That's, this is a crowd. 
And of course, you know, there were also the religious authorities were looking for him too and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering among, about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Verse 13, yet for fear, Phobos, okay, fear of being inadequate, of not having sufficient resources to deal with the situation. For fear, for Phobos of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him because they were all scared of being tossed out of the church of that time, with the synagogue, the assembly. Because if you confess that Jesus was a Christ or some of these things, well, we know that in other, the other gospel accounts, that's exactly what happened to people. That's exactly what happened to people. So the disciples had to deal with their fear, and perhaps one of the biggest things we see of the change in the disciples and the proof of the power of the, of the, the new covenant church of God is how, these, uh, how the disciples who became apostles totally changed were able to deal with their fear and in spite of whatever the situation it was and there were many fearful incidences they still did the will of god they accomplished what was necessary they set the right example they didn't let the fear immobilize them or run their lives you know to a negative aspect so they could continue to be positive and, and, and accomplish what needed to be done. They weren't so fearful of the losses they might incur by being allied with Jesus that they stopped walking and went away from him. They didn't have demos and phobos in a negative, you know, from that standpoint. They were able to deal with it and overcome it. This is, a, this is a something that we see, it, it, and it was a continuation of what we see in the Hebrew scriptures. Let's, uh, let's go to Deuteronomy, just take a look at this real quickly. Of how do you deal with it? Well, God revealed it all the way back, all the way back in the Torah, in the initial, uh, the, the, the constitutional, if you want to put it, founding documents of the Church of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, let's go to verse 58, says this, If you refuse to obey all the words of the instructions that are written in this book, and if you do not fear, here's the Greek word, um, excuse me, the Hebrew word yare, the glorious and awesome name of the Lord your God. Okay, if you don't fear, if you don't have this reverential affection and honor for God that's primary in your life, he says, then this one you ought to have this fear of, he's going to overwhelm you and your children with indescribable plagues. And he goes on to list of all these things. If you don't put, you know, the fear, the fear of, the, of me, okay, of, of, of your Lord, your God first in your life, and you let other things get in there first, then it's going to have, you know, you, actually bad things will happen to you. And it goes down verse 66, your life will constantly hang in the balance and you will live night and day in fear. Here's the Hebrew word 63, 40, 42, it's pachad, to be in dread or, you know, or, you know you're, 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 so, you're, you're just occupied in fear, unsure if you will survive. Verse 67, in the morning you will say, if only it were night. And in the evening you will say, if only it were morning, for you will be terrified by the awful horrors you see around you. This was one of the things that if you didn't keep the fear of God first in your life, you'd have all these other fears that would come upon you so that your life would be consumed with it. Let's turn with me now to Proverbs 3.19. So what is the antidote to this? Well, obviously, we should have an appropriate godly fear that takes a priority in our life. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 19. Proverbs 3, 19. It says, By wisdom the Lord founded the earth. By understanding he created the heavens. By his knowledge the, great, uh, the de deep fountains of the earth's 
burst forth and the dew settles beneath the night sky. My child, don't lose sense of common sense and discernment. Or as Amplified says, keep sound and godly wisdom and discretion. Okay, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, as it says in Psalm 111. The, the fear of the Lord, you know, hang on to them. Verse 22, for they will refresh your soul. They are like jewels on a necklace. They keep you safe on your way, and your feet will not stumble. You can go to bed without fear. Okay, not, no fear. Pachad, because you've, you've put these things before you. You've considered, and you've been thinking about, you know, of, of, of all the things that God has done and created, his faithfulness to his people, his covenant partners. You can go to bed without fear. You can lie down and sleep soundly. You know, sometimes that's not easy. And when we're having different things that are occurring to us, that's when we have to consider this. We have to think and review in our minds our fear of the appropriate, this godly reverential fear of the one we're dealing with in life. Verse 25 here in uh, Proverbs 3, you need not be afraid of sudden death, disaster, or the destruction that comes upon the wicked. See, God is for us. He does take care of us. He will see us through, whatever the situation is. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2. Isaiah has something really encouraging to say to us here. I'll cite this in the ESV. It says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust, and I will not be afraid. Pachad. I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. You see, we, we, we don't need to be afraid when God is our God, because he has promised us salvation. He's given us hope in that way. He will not forsake us. He will not forsake his saints. He's become my salvation. See, what God does for us in the church and what transformed the disciples for where at the time when Jesus was, you know, when the soldiers came to seize Jesus, what happened? The disciples all scattered. They just ran for the hills. And after his crucifixion, when they got together to talk about this, they did it behind locked doors because they were fearful. They were fearful. But God has a way of transforming this fear that we have as human beings and replacing it with something else. He helps us. He doesn't just expect us to do it on our own, by no means. And this is one of the great news of Christianity. Let's turn with me to Romans. And then one of the epistle of uh, Paul to the Romans, Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. I'll read the, this in the ESV. It said, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, phobos, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. See, God isn't even, he's not remote. He's not our taskmaster. He's, you know, he's not, he is our father. He loves us that much so that when we face problems, we can be sure he, he, you know, he doesn't just turn his head and look away from us. He will be there. And he has given us his spirit. And if, you're, you know, if, and if we don't have, of course, the spirit, we're not Christ. But, if, but for those who are Christians, truly, we, the spirit that he gives us is not one of slavery to fall back into fear. But he's given us a spirit that allows us to see that God is good and he loves us. So we can cry, Abba, Father. Turn with me now to 1 Corinthians. Let's take another thing here. Because Paul, you know, the, the Apostle Paul was not someone who never felt fear himself. 
he went through a lot in his ministry and the different things that he had to do. And he had to deal with his, you know, there are some times that he found himself that he might be fearful of a loss, fearful of things that uh, might happen to him, fearful perhaps of that he was inadequate to the task at times. But God doesn't give us a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, no. He gives us a spirit of, of, of sonship, the spirit of adoption that we, you know, we, we actually are the children of God, that we can have this hope and this confidence in God that he's there for us. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1, I'm going to read this in the Phillips uh, translation. I like the way that uh, Phillips put it. In the same way, my brothers, Apostle Paul was writing to the Corinthian brethren, when I came to proclaim to you God's secret purpose, because of course the gospel is to some degrees, it takes the spirit of God to understand what, he, what is being fully said. I did not come equipped with any brilliance of speech or intellect. You may as well know that it was my secret determination to concentrate entirely on Jesus Christ and the fact of his death upon the cross. As a matter of fact, I myself was feeling far from strong. I was nervous and rather shaky. The ESV puts it, <laughs> and I was with you in weakness and fear, phobos, and much trembling. But when Paul showed up, he'd been through a lot. <laughs> and he, and he, here he was, you know, a new city, new place, new whatever, and, you know, what was going to happen? Was he going to get beaten to an inch of his life? What was going to happen in this place? But he said, well, I was with you in weakness and in fear. What I said and preached had none of the attractiveness of the clever mind, but it was a demonstration of the power of the Spirit, because it he, it was the Spirit of God that spoke through him so that he could fulfill what he had been commissioned to do in his ministry, to preach the gospel openly in a society that, you know, that was often construed as being a subversive doctrine. Certainly wasn't politically correct in the Roman Empire of the time. Plainly, God's purpose was that your faith should not rest upon man's cleverness, but upon the power of God. So he even saw, you know, the fact, despite the fact that he had, you know, he, as he said, as he confessed, he was far from feeling strong. You know, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Nevertheless, because he feared God first, he did what he, according to the will of God, asked him to do. And as he said, it was God's purpose that, you know, it wasn't going, people weren't going to be just attracted to Paul's great personality, but to the truth of the scriptures. That, it was a, that their faith would be based on the power of God. Because it's not, you know, just going and hearing an inspirational, you know, message. Like you can go to a lot of sales media and they'll pump you up. You know, they'll give you an inspirational message and you go home and, you know, you face a a pile of tough clients, you know, that can just fade away. But faith, the spiritual faith of a Christian is based on reality. It's based on the presence of God's Spirit to, give, to, to help you to avoid fear, to avoid, you know, the, of the weakness and the fear and the trembling, to overcome it, to, to persevere through it. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 16. We'll pursue a little bit farther, you know, Apostle Paul in talking about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. I'll read this in the contemporary English version. The scriptures say, God commanded light to shine in the dark. Now God is shining in your hearts to let you know that his glory is seen in Jesus Christ. That's where, you know, this is the glory. This is where we focus on these times when we're having difficulties, when we have challenges that come upon us. Because verse 7, he, you know, he really admits we are like clay jars, just a clay pot in which this treasure is stored. 
that treasure being the Holy Spirit. The real power comes from God and not from us. And this is the key. The key to letting, not letting fear overwhelm us so that we don't fulfill the will of God in our lives, whatever it might be that he is working through us to accomplish, we must realize that it is the Spirit of God that is doing it. The real power comes from God and not from us because we're just human. But God gives us something in which we can be overcomers. We don't have to be, you know, cowardly. No, we can be overcomers. In whatever the situation we might find ourselves, verse 8, we often suffer. And he knew where I'll be spoke. We often suffer, but we are never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us. And when we are knocked down, we get up again. We face death every day because of Jesus. Our bodies show what his death was like. He was beaten and stoned and all the other things that happened to him so that his life can also be seen in us. This means that death is working in us, but life is working in you. In the scriptures it says, I spoke because I had faith. Yes, do not fear, have faith. This is what Jesus said to the disciples there on the sea. We have that same kind of faith. So we speak because we know that God raised the Lord Jesus to life and just as God raised Jesus, he will also raise us to life and will bring us into his presence together with you. This is our existential hope. This, the, the, the clean and pure fear of God in the core of our being that allows us not to give up, not to turn away, not to be fearful, so fearful of losses or being inadequate and sufficient that we stop walking with God. Verse 15, all of this has been done for you so that more and more people will know how kind God is and will praise and honor him. We never give up. Our bodies are gradually dying. Yeah, and when you're in the hospital, you see a lot of this. You see, you know, you see the people in all the different forms of falling apart. Our bodies are gradually dying, but we ourselves are being made stronger each day. These little troubles, little troubles, verse 17, are getting us ready for eternal glory that will make all our troubles seem like nothing. Things that are seen don't last forever, but things that are not seen are eternal. That's why we keep our minds on the things that cannot be seen. And we focus on those things. And we focus, and as we focus and have this pro proper reverential affection, the fear of God in our lives and think on all of what he has done. We put these things first. We keep in mind what, <laughs> what Jesus Christ has done for us, and the great love that they bear for us. God the Father willing to sacrifice his own son for our salvation. It's very clear. Fear cannot preoccupy us and motivate us and run us. Let's go to 1 John 4, 17. And how do we do this? John 4, 17. 1 John, the general epistle, 1 John 4, chapter 4 and verse 17. It says, By this is love perfected in us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. We may have confidence because we won't give up. We won't be cowardly. We won't turn away. We won't let fear run us and dominate us. Because as he is, so also we are in this world. It says there is, in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. So we all have, we, we know, because when we oftentimes, when we feel fear or sense fear or some of these things, to remind ourselves that we have yet to grow in love. 
Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. But God has given us, as the Apostle Paul plainly says in Romans 8.15, not the spirit of slavery that we should fear, but the spirit of sonship that we should rejoice and shout, praise God, because he will help us to overcome and to stand the last day and to inherit all things and live in a time when our fears will be a thing of the past.